In an early 1980s commercial for Fisher Price, a little boy dressed in overalls and a baseball cap appears. He puts a yellow cassette tape into his beige and brown tape recorder. He, seemingly unconsciously, keeps bumping the tape player into the railing on the stairs and also on a doorframe. At the end of the commercial, the tape player falls to the ground and a narrator comes in and says, The Fisher Price tape recorder, you can't knock the fun out of it. This classic Fisher Price toy was incredibly well designed and was truly engineered to withstand the damage that a toddler could impart on their toys. It had a large, sturdy handle on it that was easy for little hands to grip, and it had four large buttons on top play, rewind, fast forward, and record. On the front of the cassette player, there was a combo stop slash eject button. My sister and I had this very same tape recorder, and it lasted us for many, many years. I'm sure we gave it away in mint condition as we took very good care of our toys, especially my sister. As I've mentioned in a few shows, my sister was incredibly bright, and this was apparent at a very young age, and I'm not just saying that because she's no longer with us. She was the kind of kid who you would get frustrated with because you had studied for hours and hours for a test and failed it, and she absorbed enough information just in class and aced the test. She was truly brilliant. She learned to talk when she was around a year old, and my mom recently told me that women at the grocery store would periodically come over to her and ask her how old her baby was because they couldn't believe how a child so very little could talk so much and so, well, eloquently. The tape player came with a yellow cassette I described in the commercial at the top of this episode, and we hung on to that tape for many, many years, long after we didn't have the player to go with it. I believe my sister received this as a birthday gift or maybe a Christmas present when she was probably two or three as it was released in 1980. She and my mom would periodically record a few things here and there, and I distinctly remember listening to the tape and hearing my sister in her sweet, little, little voice sing, Girls just want to have fun. Girls want to have fun. Girls just want to have fun, in case you're not familiar, was a very popular song released by MTV superstar Cyndi Lauper in 1983. To my knowledge, my parents did not own any Cyndi Lauper records or cassettes, and my parents generally sang a songs either they made up themselves or classic children's songs like Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. My sister must have heard this song a few times while traveling in the car, our amazing 240DL Volvo, as a very young little girl, and somehow managed to recite the lyrics into her Fisher-Price tape recorder, further attesting to her intelligence. On today's show, we will be discussing the nearly 100-year history of Fisher-Price toys. We will discuss the company's early days when they started out with just a few toys dubbed the 16 Hopefuls to the company known today with a catalog of well over 5,000 toys. So bust out your corn popper, bang on your xylophone, and put some little people on each of your fingers. Here we go. Hello, and thank you so very much for tuning into the Pop Culture Retrospective podcast, a show inspired by, and in memory of, my big sister Rebecca, and her love for all things pop culture, especially the people, places, and things of the 1980s, 1990s, and early 2000s. My name is Amy Lewis, and I am your captain aboard this pop culture time machine. You are tuning into episode number 11, Fisher Price Toys. We will hopefully have achieved yet another milestone with this episode, nearing or possibly surpassing 500 downloads of the show. I'm going to ixnay on the whole milestones thing here for a while, but I wanted to share that. Thank you so much for being a part of this journey. The Pop Culture Retrospective podcast for me has been a journey first and foremost of grief, but also of happy memories, nostalgia, some comedy, aka my bad jokes, and hopefully an escape from all of the hard stuff that life can throw at us. But let's get back to today's episode. 
October 1st is essentially a religious holiday for me, as that date marks the opening of Walt Disney World, which welcomed its first guests in 1971. Walt Disney World will most certainly be the topic of a future episode, or most likely episodes, plural, but October 1st is also an important date in the world of toys. On October 1st, 1930, Fisher-Price began making toys in East Aurora, New York. The company was founded by Herman Herm Fisher, Irving and Margaret Evans Price, and Helen Shelley. Herm Fisher previously worked in the toy industry. He advertised and sold games. Also, he was once president of All Fair Toys, but he wanted a company of his own. Irving Price was a retiree of the Woolworth Company. He helped with the financing of Fisher Price. His wife, Margaret, was an illustrator who also helped with the company's creation. Margaret Price was the first art director for the company. Taking inspiration from her children's storybooks, she designed the -the state-of-the-art push-and-pull toys, which were a staple in Fisher Price's early days. Finally, Helen Shelley was also a founder of the company. She was an owner of a successful toy store called the Penny Walker Toy Shop in New York. Side note, Helen Shelley lived to be over 100 years old, proving that being a kid at heart is truly good for your overall health. Despite her impressive contributions, sadly, Shelley's name didn't make it into the logo or the business name, but she definitely left her mark. The company started off relatively small. They had just 15 employees, and by 1931, they had a line of just over a dozen or so toys. They were dubbed the 16 Hopefuls, and the group brought them to the International Toy Fair in New York City that same year. The toys were a hit, especially Granny Doodle and Dr. Doodle, who are truly the face of the original line. They are ducks, made of wood, complete with moving wheels. As you moved the duck, the neck would extend and retract, and the beak opened and closed. In their first catalog, Fisher-Price described their high-quality toys as gay, cheerful, friendly toys with amusing action, toys that do something new and surprising and funny. Some of the early toys also include the likes of Disney's Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck on pull toys. Surprisingly, the Donald Duck toys were more popular than the Mickey Mouse toys. In his head, Mickey Mouse must have been thinking, Oh boy, Donald's more popular than me. Ha ha. That's unfortunate. That's my best impersonation of Mickey Mouse. Anyways, later in 1931, the very first shipment of toys were sent to Macy's in New York City. Unfortunately, Fisher-Price came to fruition during the Great Depression, and as a result, their company was significantly impacted. During their first four years of operation, Fisher-Price lost about two-thirds of their capital. By the end of the 1930s, things were starting to look up for the company. In 1938, Fisher-Price released the Snoopy Sniffer, which was also a pull toy. The dog was white with black spots, and his nose is on the ground in the sniffing position, of course. He was incredibly popular and has remained one of the company's best-selling toys of all time. When he was released and started selling like hotcakes, the company was finally able to turn a profit. And in case you were wondering, Fisher Price's Snoopy came out well before Charles Schultz's version. During World War II, Fisher Price stopped production of toys in favor of supporting the war effort. Herm Fisher said, quote, If the war requires our entire plant... We will suspend toy making for the duration. End quote. The company would go on to make crates for the Red Cross and manufactured parts for aircraft. By 1946, production started again, this time with about 35 or maybe 40 employees. The toy business really started booming during this time. In the early years, the company used ponderosa pine, but by the 1950s, they started using plastic and toys. Plastic could retain color and decorations much longer than wood could. One of their popular plastic toys was Queen Busy Bee, which was a pull toy. Her wings and antenna would move when her string was pulled, and she made a buzz-buzz sound, much to the delight of many a child. The late 1950s saw the release of some gold standard Fisher-Price toys, including the xylophone. I'm pretty sure I had one, and my kids definitely had one. Snaplock beads, which I distinctly remember playing with at my grandparents' house when I was a toddler. I'm sure that belonged to my dad and aunt when they were children. And the infamous corn popper. Millions of people are familiar with the corn popper. It's often used by children who are just learning to walk. 
The toy combines action and sound where plastic balls move and pop within a clear plastic or fiberglass dome while being pushed by a blue stick with a handle. The company really started to grow during this time. The Lookie Fire Truck was the predecessor to the Play Family, later Little People line. There were two small firemen on the back of the fire truck, and soon, in 1959, there was a bus. The bus featured a driver that was permanently attached, but there were six passengers that could be taken out of the bus and played with separately. In 1960, the Rack a Stack came out, which is the multicolored rings on the yellow stick. I can't think of one child in my family that hasn't played with this or had this as a toy. It's so simple, but it's so brilliant all at the same time. The company has made at least 52 million units of this classic toy. And a fun fact, if you were to stack all of them on top of each other, you could reach from Los Angeles, California to Paris, France. The Chatter Telephone was released in 1963. It was a white rotary telephone on wheels with a stretchy cord. As you move the phone, a set of eyes open and close on the front of the phone. At one point, the Fisher-Price company tried changing the dial to push button, but customers complained, and so they returned to the initial rotary style. My first job after graduate school was as an alternative ed teacher, and a colleague and I ran an after-school program housed at a local church. One afternoon, a student of mine needed to call her parents for a ride, and I can't remember if maybe she didn't have a cell phone or maybe her battery was dead or something, but nonetheless, she needed to call home. Her only option was to call home on the church's rotary phone located in the kitchen. I brought her over to said phone, pointed to it, and said, here you go. You can call your parents here. She looked at me as if my hair was on fire. I then spent the next several minutes giving her a tutorial on how to use a rotary phone, which really felt instinctive to me, even though they had long been out of everyday use for most people, which I think I sometimes forget about when it comes to technology. In the 1960s, Fisher-Price realized that one of their best sources of research and development came through the eyes and hands, of course, of children. The Fisher-Price research and development arm of the company decided to put a nursery school in their facility dubbed the Play Lab. They had a two-way mirror where children could be viewed playing with the toys and the company could learn what may be a hit and what may be a miss. Currently, at least 3,500 children go through the lab each year at Fisher Price. And for the time, that was incredibly innovative. In 1968, Fisher Price released the Play Family Farm. The playset came with a barn with a silo attached, as well as farm animals and a farmer, of course, complete with a tractor. When you open the barn door, it says, This has been the most popular Little People line and has sold 16.5 million units. In 1969, the company was sold to the Quaker Oats Company, which is based in Chicago. They helped expand the brand. It was really important to Fisher-Price to find another company that aligned with their values. By 1970, the Quaker Oats Company spent $1 million on advertising for Fisher-Price. They had the funds and capital to do commercials, print advertisements, etc. And speaking of Quaker Oats, let's have a moment of silence in memory of Wilford Brimley, who was their spokesperson for many, many years and who passed away earlier this month at the age of 85. And a few thoughts about Wilford Brimley. Did anyone else not realize that he was actually still alive? I feel kind of like a jerk for saying that, but he seemed pretty elderly when I was a kid. In addition to the Quaker Oats commercials, he was also in the 80s film Cocoon and a plethora of commercials for Liberty Medical, where he discussed coping with diabetes. Now, diabetes is, of course, not a laughing matter by any means, but he sort of got on to everyone's radar because he always pronounced diabetes as diabetes. His pronunciation is so distinct that it's really the only thing I remember from those commercials besides his stunningly handsome handlebar mustache. Multiple people have created videos on YouTube that blend together many of the clips of him saying diabetes into a hilarious remix or rap, if you will. And these are not recent because of his passing. People caught on to this astounding phenomena years and years ago, and I am so grateful 
and better for it. I will definitely put a link to these videos in the show notes. They are quite hilarious. Um, And hearing the word diabetes, diabetes, diabetes over and over again is quite hilarious. But again, of course, diabetes is not funny. It's just his pronunciation of the word is hysterical. In the 1970s, Fisher-Price started making toys for infants as well as more little people products, including a play castle and a music box record player, which had multicolored grooved records about the size of a CD. They would play nursery rhymes. This was a staple in many a childhood playroom, including me and my sisters. The birth rate started to drop in the 1970s, so the company needed to focus on toys for older kids as well. They started creating dolls, as well as an adventure series, and a line of Sesame Street toys. In 1979, they released a record player, which was brown and beige with a yellow arm, which housed the needle. I mentioned this in a previous show, but my sister and I had that very same record player. While jumping on her bed to music, I landed on it and ended up with a nice black eye. I don't know if anyone else did this, but my sister and I like to put small toys on top of the record player, and we really enjoyed watching them fly off when the record started playing. On this record player, you could play the small 78 records on it by twisting up a plastic piece, and you could also play a 33. The 78 single, Just Got Paid by Johnny Kemp, was often played on a record player. It was my dad's. Let's discuss the music video for Just Got Paid for just a second. First of all, Just Got Paid is really a timeless song. It was actually remade by NSYNC in the early 2000s. The original song came out in 1987, and the music video for it is classic, late 80s. It opens with Johnny, perhaps getting off of work as an architect, I want to say. He walks up the stairs to his apartment, blueprints in hand, and drops off all of his work materials and changes into his Friday night going out suit. Taking a cue from Michael Bolton, perhaps... He does not wear a tie with his suit, but instead opts to button his collar all the way to the top. And, just like Michael Bolton, his suit for sure has shoulder pads. He makes sure to style his chin-length hair in the half-up, half-down style that was exactly how I did my hair every single day when I was in 8th grade. Believe me, I get it. It's really hard to do anything active if you have hair in your face. I mean, the least you could do is pull part of it back. He and a large group of people are first dancing outside on the sidewalk and eventually make their way into a nightclub. Prior to the filming of this music video, there must have been a large discount sale on spandex because many of the dancers are clad in the infamous tight black clothing. Two dancers that they keep panning to have on black Nike onesies with yellow t-shirts underneath. Another set of dancers, three women this time, also have on black spandex shorts, complete with neon-colored suspenders, black scrunch socks, and black baseball caps. These get-ups remind me of my sister, who danced to Snap's hit song Power in our elementary school's talent show, clad in black spandex pants, a neon-colored t-shirt, scrunch socks, and a black baseball cap. Definitely standard fashion apparel for performing and dancing. The early 1980s saw the release of some of me and my sister's favorite and most used toys, including the tape recorder, which we discussed at the top of the show, as well as the family playhouse, which I still have and my kids love playing with it. The birth rate increased during the 1980s and the company shifted back to toys for younger kids. The family playhouse came with several little people figurines, as well as a car that fits into the garage with a door that moves up and down. It even has a doorbell and it still works to this day. It's clear when I look at it now that this house is definitely 40 years old. The carpet in the bedroom is pea green, and the living room's carpet is bright blue. The kitchen floor also matches with the flooring we had in our kitchen growing up, a faux brick linoleum. This playhouse is almost like a time capsule. Up until 1986, Fisher-Price made a small horse on wheels with a red seat, a yellow plastic rein to hold while riding, and a blue storage compartment below. And we owned this horse. The wheels make a unique sound whenever they are in motion. My mother saved this horse, and my kids still play with it to this day, even though they're way too big for it. But I can't bear to put it away anytime soon. It has to be at least 30 years old, and despite decades of use, the only issue it has is cosmetic. The color has faded a bit, but otherwise it is still very much in usable condition, which is really a testament to the durability of their toys. 
Also during the 1980s, Fisher-Price released gummy bear toys to coincide with the popular Disney television cartoon, as well as puffalumps, which were a very soft, plush, stuffed animal. They sold 25 million puffalumps when they were first introduced. I had the blue dog called Puppy Love. It was the company's most successful new introduction to date. In the mid-1980s, the company essentially started to bite off more than they could chew. They developed more tech-related toys for older children, including an AM-FM radio with microphone and a $200 camcorder that could film on small cassette-sized tapes. Someone uploaded some video clips they filmed on the camera on YouTube, and the quality is definitely pretty bad, but I guess at the time it must have seemed pretty cool. However, you can get a pretty decent camera now for $200 in 2020. You know, $200 in 1987, that is quite a lot. As a result of some of these products that were not as successful, Fisher-Price found themselves struggling financially. By the early 1990s, the company was restructured and the focus would again be on very young children. In 1993, Quaker Oats decided to sell Fisher-Price and Mattel quickly snatched them up. Beginning in 1994, Fisher-Price started to create more outdoor-focused toys as well as games, dolls, and electronic devices. They got bit by the technology bug and started developing computers and software for young children. These would all go on to be bestsellers. Also during this year, the Fisher-Price line took over for the development of Power Wheels. I always wanted a Power Wheels growing up, back in the days long before Fisher-Price was a company that made them. Alas, I never got the Power Wheels. I never got a treehouse either. God, I was so deprived as a child. Okay, I really wasn't, but man, I wanted both of those things. Anyways, in 1997, Mattel and Tyco Toys merged. Tyco was a very successful company as well. They were responsible for Magna Doodle, The Viewmaster, and Tickle Me Elmo. When I was a young kid, some family friends of ours had a Viewmaster, and one of their slides was stills from the music video for Michael Jackson's Thriller. Looking at those pictures terrified me as a child terrified me. But to this day, the Viewmaster, I think, is one of my all-time favorite toys. The 2000s thus far have been a period of progress and some setbacks for the Fisher-Price company. In the early 2000s, Fisher-Price revisited the development of tech items for toddlers by developing DVD players, digital cameras, and binoculars. They also purchased the rights to the childhood classic character, Thomas the Train, minus the wooden railway line. In 2013, the Little People line became more diversified and featured figurines from different ethnic backgrounds. In 2019, Fisher-Price faced some harsh criticism because they had to recall all models of their rock-and-play sleeper as 30 infants sadly died while using them. The sleeper placed infants on an inclined position, which was not recommended by pediatricians. They faced some controversy not only because of these deaths, but because they did not seek medical advice prior to its development and availability on the market. This was certainly a difficult situation to digest for generations of families who have loved Fisher-Price toys. This all came about as a result of a Consumer Reports investigation. Thus far, 2020 has been a relatively creative year for Fisher-Price. They are currently selling a Little People set that resembles the Beatles from their Yellow Submarine days. That little Paul McCartney figurine is so darn cute, I could just roll him over with my car tire. Oh my god. They also have a collection called Baby Biceps, which includes a dumbbell, a sweatband, a kettleball, and a protein shake cup. Now, if teenagers and adults aren't self-conscious enough about their appearance... Why not ensure that infants are too? Before we know it, a child's first sentence will be, Does this onesie make me look fat, Dada? Okay, that's a bit excessive, but you know where I'm going with this. The chatter phone has been reimagined, and your child can look like a young Stevie gold dust woman Nix with their very own tambourine. And, perhaps inspired by the pandemic, your child can also work from home with the help of my personal favorite, the Fisher-Price My Home Office playset, which includes a toddler-sized insulated coffee mug, a laptop, cell phone, and a headphone-slash-microphone headset. Professional-looking top with clashing sweatpant bottoms not included. 
If you press the top right-hand button of the laptop, a parental-sounding voice comes on and says, For the love of God, will you kids please be quiet? Mama needs to get some work done. Stop pushing your brother! Okay, that is obviously not actually a part of this playset, but I really could have used a button like that on my work computer a few months ago. That would have saved my vocal cords some serious strain. Kids need to understand that the struggle is real for parents working from home. I hope you've enjoyed this look back at Fisher Price, a long-standing toy company that has been a part of American culture, and abroad, of course, for almost 100 years. Over the course of the company's history, they have developed over 5,000 different toys which are sold in more than 150 countries around the world. Further, from their humble beginnings, Fisher Price is now a billion-dollar company. If you are enjoying the Pop Culture Retrospective podcast, please consider subscribing on whichever podcast platform you use. Please also consider rating the show on iTunes or Apple Podcasts. It helps the show out quite a lot. Thank you so much for tuning in and for your support. Please tell your friends and family about this show. Recommending this podcast to people you care about would really mean a lot, so please spread the word. Put up a Facebook post about it, tweet about it, do an Instagram story about it, please share. Please feel free to contact me. My email address is popcultureretrospective at gmail.com, or you can tweet me. I'm at popcultureretro. I hope you will join me for my next show, where we will be discussing the classic 1980s film Troop Beverly Hills, one of my sister's favorite movies that I too adored. Until then, be kind, be safe, and hold on to your memories.